Edward Perry, 10 Pine Ridge Road. I too want to thank the town council and all the other people who have worked hard on this ordinance. It's been an educational experience for my wife and myself to see the thing grow over the years. And uh, I guess for once since it started, I can agree with uh, Mr. Maxwell. And uh, I have some concerns that parallel uh, his concerns as uh, my property is about to become non-conforming. I certainly expected from the beginning to see uh, the use of my property become more restricted. Uh, I have one specific question about uh, paragraph E on page 60. After reading the paragraph over and over again, uh, the only thing that I can deduct from the paragraph is that uh, while people who are here today, uh, whether they're in agriculture or residence, uh, as soon as the ordinance is enacted, they're going to be restricted. Uh, new construction uh, will be allowed in, in the buffer zones that are talked about until the year 2000. Uh, is, am I interpreting that correctly? Um, I, uh, well, it says, it starts paragraph E, <coughs> goes down to the bottom of the page, and up in the top it says they hit, you have 10 years from the enactment of the ordinance to uh, complete construction. Tom, you want to take that? Mr. Perry is referring to the grandfathering provisions and includes the grandfathering of lots in approved subdivisions provided they were approved as of a certain date. If you have such a grandfathered subdivision lot, then you are grandfathered for residential use provided that you build within uh, said 10 years. That's right. That answer your question? Uh, yes, I have one. I, I kind of feel it's an a little bit of an inequity here is I also saw somebody else, uh, I think it was Steve Witten, stand up. And what is happening here is that the people with subdivisions are getting treated differently from the people who are the individual landowners. Whereas a person who doesn't fall in the subdivision category is an individual landowner, they can't do anything. But the person who happens to have the subdivision, uh, at the same time has 10 years to do something. I, I think in order to make the ordinance uh, really equitable, I think the 100 foot buffer zone, if it's gonna be enforced, ought to be enforced equally on all the property owners that fall within the buffer zone. Thank you. Tom, you wanna take that again? I think the, the idea of the date for subdivisions was that there are many subdivisions, including the most recent subdivisions, that have gone through the scrutiny of the present wetlands ordinances. So it wasn't that this was favoring subdivision lots as opposed to any other land. It was to recognize that since 1976 you have had wetlands alteration provisions in effect, um, significant provisions in effect, um, that these subdivisions presumably had to meet if they were to be approved. And that's why uh, those were uh, grandfathered, if you will, because they've already gone through, in, in most instances, a uh, scrutiny. Thank you. Then wouldn't it be fair to give all the property owners that fall within the buffer zone a chance to go through the wetlands alteration permit process in, instead of only the ones that uh, fell after this date? I think there's a point there, myself personally. Now, maybe Council Creamlin, you want to add anything to it one way or the other? I don't think I can say any more, Mr. Perry, other than what uh, Tom has said already. I think we're talking a 1976 date when the old regulations of wetland alteration permits became effective so that we already had a system um, that was weighing, um, you know, the value of uh, building versus the uh, the importance of the uh, land not being disturbed. Um, I, I'm not sure as a, as a policy decision just to either eliminate that 
uh, date uh, would, in a sense, <coughs> really allow um, either landowners or subdivisions to be regarded in an equal way. Tom, am I? Maybe we could best state it as follows, that everyone owns their land subject to reasonable regulation of both this town, the state, and the federal government. That's the general proposition we're coming from. Um, that's why you can, uh, to further the purposes of this wetlands ordinance, adopt it. Um, so we start there. What we're doing in the grandfathering sections is, is, is compromising and saying, you know, balancing uh, the rights of people to utilize their lots uh, the way they anticipated if they bought a subdivision lot, where do you draw the line? So I call this just a balancing act when you get into grandfathering, you're trying to uh, lessen the impact. Every bit of grandfathering you do lessens the environmental protection provisions of this ordinance. And really, it's, it's a, I, I, I can only call it a compromise, but here it seems to be directly related. Lots that were approved after 76, mm -hmm. when you had wetlands alteration provisions, and provided they don't occur in a critical wetland zone. That seems to be a compromise. I would say it's a fair compromise, but that's for you to decide. But it's a compromise. You thought with those restrictions, you could grandfather those. Someone else who's always owned the land subject to the regulations of the town may say, well, you know, we haven't done anything with it for 100 years. We're thinking about it. Um, boy, we're not grandfathered now, and that's true. But that's no different if it was a wetlands ordinance or when you're talking about a zoning ordinance. Um, it's the same. It's the same thing. Yeah, I think I, I mean, I understand that. And, and this date is, I think, the fourth date that we kept pushing further and further and further back, again, uh, allowing more and more people to do uh, what they wanted to do. But I think there, there came a point where we said we were going to stop at 1976 because prior to that point, there just wasn't the same safeguards. Yep. Just Thank a minute. You. But I didn't, un maybe I didn't understand your question. I, they are protected in a development that is, but an individual isn't protected. Wasn't that your question? Right. I, I don't have my copy of the ordinance right here, but I believe what it says, if you're in a subdivision that was approved after 1976, where you, the subdivision followed the wetlands alteration permit, you have, and you have not done anything, you have 10 years from the enactment of the ordinance to do something. If you fall into a subdivision that was not approved uh, after 1976, you can do nothing. If you are not in a subdivision at all, you can't do anything. Only the people who fall into the subdivision area are the ones that can take advantage of the 10-year grandfathering. And, and somehow I think that's a weakness in the ordinance uh, that could be corrected. I'm not exactly sure how to do it, but I, I think it should be. Council Cogshaw, do you have your hand up there? Sort of. Sort of. Um, there, there are some lots that are on, in subdivisions now that even with the current ordinance would not be considered buildable because they are in wetlands areas. So that is not going to uh, penalize the owner any more than they already are. Right. Because they, they, they fall under the old RP mm -hmm. zoning, which is now the critical wetlands. Right, which mm -hmm. encompasses a lot of these others that are... Basically, what here. this is talking about is, the, is the hun those people that fall within the 100-foot buffer zone uh, or any of the buffer zones where you become a non-conforming building, is that those people who are in a subdivision after 1976 have 10 years to do something, whereas those people who are not in a subdivision or are in a subdivision before 1976 have until the ordinance is enacted to do something. And if they don't do anything by then, then they're, well, they can't do anything. They have to meet the current ordinance though, right. anyway. Right. So many, the same, many of the same restrictions are still there. So two pieces of property, two adjacent pieces of property in, the, in a buffer zone, one fella can come in and do anything he wants where the person who has been there, you can be right next to them, can't do anything, even though they're in the same buffer zone adjacent to the same wetlands. And th that, well, it doesn't quite seem an equ equitable application. Uh, 
for some people to bite the bullet and others not. I, when we started the ordinance, I didn't realize, you know, there was going to be grandfathering. I thought, good, well, everybody will bite the bullet together and we'll have a buffer zone. But one person uh, sitting there on his piece of property uh, can't do anything, and the person next to them can build a pool and drainage ditches and uh, no, until the year 2000. Not, not if he's still in the critical, if there's... Um certain vegetation and critical Well, if he's in the wetlands here. buffer zone, he can. But if he's in the critical wetlands, nobody can do anything now or in the future. That basically ha hasn't changed, I don't believe. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you very much. Somebody else want to speak? How many people here still wants to speak? We've been at this for two hours, and I don't want to cut anybody off. One, two, three, four. Okay, lady in red. Partly read, I'll clarify. <laughs> uh, my name is Deborah Botello, and I live at 26 Highview Road. And there's been a lot of discussion this evening on uh, the map here, and I, looking at it, it has, it is amazing. There's been a lot of work done on this, and I realize that. Um, I, my land abuts Lot 27 on Highview, and that is or was an RP zone. Now. I realize what you've been saying here, that the map is not all that accurate, but it's kind of upsetting to see that the little circles are there that shows that we have vegetation, but we are not a crit critical wetland according to this. Now, I'm hoping that that changes because over the past few years, if you'll recall, we've enjoyed a little bit of notoriety concerning that RP zone, and to not have it mentioned is a little scary. <laughs> Um, I guess I want to go on record as saying I sincerely hope that in a final draft of whatever map you, you do that uh, that will be so designated because it's really crucial to us. We've fought long and hard. It's still in the courts and um, it is an RP. It, it, it should be designated a critical wetland. If the map isn't accurate, the final draft, we're going to be in a lot of trouble because one of the few things that we had to go on when we first started this fight was we found maps from when they did the water studies, you know, years ago, and they were wonderful, and they were they really helped us a lot. Most people, you know, where will we all be in five or ten or fifteen years? None of you know, we don't know that. These things, this is what you go on when you when you have to do this type of thing. We either leave a legacy, or or we don't. And to leave out a critical wetland on an RP zone that everybody is well acquainted with was a little bit upsetting. I just hope that. Um, I mean, I go on record as saying that I would, I would hope that it is designated there. Uh, I think it's a smaller one, too, that I'm not too familiar with. I've seen on other maps. And will these, I know that you're going over going the whole thing, but the wetlands, the critical wetlands are really kind of. The map is going to be reviewed. Yes. OK. All right, I thank you. The, the town clerk has been taking all of uh, notes this evening with respect to these uh, concerns. These is this is this officially, uh, Debbie? Can this be considered a, an, a formal submission so that this material can go to the? Okay, so this material can go to uh, Mr. Daigle to, and and Mr. McVean to have in terms of the updating. Okay, and will we see a final version of the map in October so that if we see something is missing? I hope before Daigle October. <laughs> okay, thank you. Lady in white. My name is Gail Darling, and I live on Carriage Hill Road. And I just have been thinking about the issue of appeal, whether there is some appeal from this process. And as I understand it, the council has more or less resolved the issue to say that because this is part of the zoning ordinance and because the zoning ordinance has its own appeal procedures, that that should be sufficient to cover the issue. Except for the fact that there's 30 days in which you have to appeal the permit and you may not know about it until after that. Would it not be possible to ask the Cape Courier in certain instances to publish public notices of some of those permits when they're granted? Would it be possible for citizens who are concerned about a property to request the town to put those on a list and if a permit is granted against those properties to have it published in the courier, so we would have 30 days to appeal it. Possibilities, though? You know, the, the Cape Courier is an independent newspaper. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if any citizen, you know, wants to recommend to them... I, I have spoken with Ellen Van Fleet, and she would mm -hmm. be more than happy to publish notices of permits. She has told me that. Um, the issue is whether the town will obligate itself to publish notices of permits issued against a certain list of, of questionable properties. 
the, the, the town itself does not determine which properties are questionable. No, no, I understand it, uh, that. I, I simply mean that whether, whether abutters who, who have no other mechanism for being notified can come to the town and saying, please put this property on a list that we feel that it's a questionable area and should a permit be issued, we'd like an opportunity to be notified through the Cape Courier so that we can do something about it. Would this be specific to just wetland areas or well, any? I think that that's a question for the council to decide. I'm simply looking for a way to fill this loophole between the one month period that you've got to appeal it and the five months you have to start the construction so that somebody knows the permit's been issued. Again, I, I think I hear your request. I think we're, we're talking about the, uh, you know, the problem of how uh, inclusive to be, which is a, diff a difficult uh, I mean, story. I'd be happy to start out by saying let's restrict it to wetlands, and then if that turns out to, to, to be feasible, the town could cons certainly consider expanding it to all permits. But for right now, because this is such an issue of concern to the town, and because once somebody does start to build, there isn't much you can do about it. It's the, the only thing I'd like to say to that is that it's a matter of such important public policy. I think your suggestion is a good one, but we can't be dependent on the existence of the, of the Cape Courier or not within the town to formulate public policy on this. If well, we no, I just understand that the code officer has a lot of stuff to do, and I, I was looking for a way to relieve him of having to keep a list and send letters to neighbors and so forth and so on, and I know the Cape Courier in this instance is, is anxious to do that kind of public service. That's all. I think we should take a more permanent approach to it. Feel free. I, I'm just looking to fill that loophole. In I think some way. it's something that we should discuss as a council. And you, it would be an administrative deal or not within the ordinance. Council McLaughlin. Okay. I said it. That's it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else? Got a couple more. Yes, sir. There's been a lot of talk, and uh, good evening. I'm Bob Taylor, and I represent Stonegate Associates, who is a major landowner here in town and a land developer, so we come at it with a slightly different focus than some other people. But I would like to, uh, in, the, in the face of the great number of comments made tonight, just hit a few points and, uh, and let the council get on with the deliberations. One, uh, the process started because there were perceived deficiencies in the existing wetlands ordinance. And I have been a, a regular, probably not 100 uh, percent participant in this process. And I've never really heard a cogent discussion of what these perceived deficiencies were and how the new ordinance addresses them. Secondly, I believe the ordinance will be a substantial administrative burden. Um, and I'm not sure uh, that we've demonstrated an improvement in the protection of high value wetlands. Thirdly, I believe that uh, uniformity of wetlands definition is appropriate. I, uh, I've heard other people suggest the Corps of Engineers definition. And I think that that's fine. Fourthly, Appendix A and B, which are an integral part of the ordinance, are not attached to any distributed copies of the ordinance. And I am aware of at least one substantial revision to uh, one of the quoted appendices. Uh, and I would urge the council to at least review um, the appendices uh, in their current state before voting approval. Um, thirdly, um, I have not uh, heard. Uh, a large number of technical arguments about why a 100-foot buffer, why a 250-foot buffer. And I would offer um, the general suggestion that the need for buffers is perhaps best determined by the specific facts of a specific situation. And I would suggest that an approach to the ordinance might be that even more activities than are approved now be allowed as special permit activities with the planning board uh, making the determination what is an appropriate buffer based on the specific facts of a specific situation. I think that this might also be uh, a lesser hardship on the citizens of the town when we talk about adopting an ordinance and living with it. My suggestion is that we adopt the ordinance with broader special permit provisions and then if we find a deficiency, we tighten up the ordinance mm -hmm. rather than starting tight and having to come back and loosen up. I believe that there ought to be a provision for hardship review uh, to be made by the Zoning Board of Appeals. That is not included. I believe that the provisions for utilization of existing footprint per the assessor's card uh, um, as it exists 
on April 1, 1990, ought to have added to it uh, some language like, or such other reasonable evidence acceptable to the building inspector. I think that overall, this is going to be a complicated and difficult ordinance to administer, and I would suggest that the council think very hard about adopting this um, because I think it will be a substantial administrative burden. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. Yes. Good evening. My name is Tim Thompson. I live at Pine Ridge Road in Cape Elizabeth. First of all, I too would like to thank the council and the members uh, for the time that they've spent in developing this. I think it is a very, very important piece of, of uh, legislation that you're putting together. This ordinance is, it is complicated and it is critical because the problem that it's correcting or working on correcting is critical. Our wetlands are a very valued and uh, delicate part of our environment and they, they need to be protected. I think many points, I wasn't even going to get up tonight, but it was such uh, an interesting uh, opportunity to listen to the many points that were brought up. I did want to at least give my, my point of view and I'll be very brief. First of all, I think Mr. Maxwell's points were well taken and uh, I do appreciate and respect the fact that his family has protected our, our wetlands and, and through farming and agriculture uh, have been very careful in how they utilize that, that land that's been uh, in their family for so many years. And the, the Maxwells I'm not too concerned about. Uh, I am concerned that we get ordinances in place so that if and when the Maxwell farm is broken up at some point, we have the, the ordinances in place so that those lands are protected and, and there is some direction on how those lands can be developed. Uh, I think personally as a, a landowner of a small, small piece of property in Cape Elizabeth, that as an abutter to one of these major developments that I do have rights. I don't think it's, it's as simple as Mr. Maxwell had, had uh, put forth tonight that because they have a piece of property, nobody has an opportunity to imp input on how and what happens with that property. If I live next to a development that's going to be uh, significant where septic tanks are going to be utilized and sewer systems are not, and drainage, gonna, drainage uh, problems are going to be created because of the development, and as an abutter I'm affected, then I certainly have an opportunity and should be given that opportunity to input. Uh, one of the questions that I have that uh, my good friend Mr. Perry brought up, and I don't, maybe I didn't understand the response to it, but if you could explain to me how, one more time, how equitable treatment is going to be put forth on these buffer zones. Uh, I still do not think that that, uh, that is one area. Uh, I'm very, very much in favor of this ordinance and I want it put in place, but if there's a fine tuning that needs to take place, I think it's this uh, grandfathering, how far back, uh, if we've got wetlands alteration permits procedures in place, why can't we uh, apply those equally, whether it was a development that was 76 or 80 or 81 or one goes back to uh, earlier. If we've got wetlands, if we've got alteration permit procedures in place, why don't we, why can't we utilize, utilize those regardless of when that development was uh, in place? If, for example, the point that, uh, uh, that was make, made, there are lots that are in developments that could not, based on current uh, ordinances, wetlands ordinances, couldn't be built on, maybe we could apply that to all of the uh, developments that are in place um, equally. Uh, a question that I have regarding uh, the, what was previously RP zones, is it my understanding that the RP zones are going to be remapped? No. Okay. Cause they're that, gone. Okay. But at now they're critical wetlands. That's right. But are those critical wetlands, what were previously RP zones, mm -hmm. we're not talking about circles and, and uh, confused uh, symbols. We're talking about very well mapped out RP zones, and I, I would be very cautious about giving an opportunity to remap uh, those what were previously per very well protected RP zones now that they're critical wetlands. So uh, I would really hate to see that come into open a bit debate again. Uh, but I think the 
ordinance as you've drafted it. It's been fun coming in and participating in this. Again, I congratulate the town on this form of government. It certainly gives everybody an opportunity to get their points across. Uh, we're not with this. We've, we're going to be able to protect our, our wetlands. We're not going to be like our neighbor to the south, Massachusetts, trying to reclaim wetlands that are already lost or the state of Iowa that's lost 90 percent of their wetlands. Hopefully with this we can protect our environment and keep it the way we love it so much. Thank you. Thank you. Is anybody else? No? Yes. Quick. Yeah. I'll try not to be as long as you want. How are we doing? Jody Jordan, Ocean Oak Road. Um, most of the farm I'm farming, I'm probably all of it's in your critical wetland. The ordinance says I will be able to farm as long as I keep farming. Is that true? Mm -hmm. And what happens if I should get sick for a year? Then still I won't farm. Still, still How many years grandfathered then? The land hasn't changed. As long as the land, use of the land doesn't change. If I want to lay it, let it lay for a year or two, it's, I can go right back to farm. Mm -hmm. All righty. Now, on your, you got to register a pond. If I'm farming, do I have to register the pond to maintain it? Or? If you want to be protected and you want that pond to remain a pond and not be called a critical wetland at some point, yes, you would have to register it. Now, what about? And there'd oh. be 90 days to register it after the ordinance went in effect, if it went in effect. Most all my ponds are connected to the LY Brook. Is that, if I register the, the pond, is that going to be called the Brook too, or? No. No, I'd have to defer to Steve. Thanks. <laughs> um, probably get all of us up before we're done, but. At what point? At what point you would call part of a stream a pond? I don't know. I mean, I think if you had some damning activity, and if you wanted to play it safe, if I were Mr. Jordan, I would register it. I would register anything that perhaps looked like a pond to err on the side of, of safety. Um, I'm not sure at what point the uh, the code enforcement office is going to, you know, say it's not a pond and it's not needed. But I think if there's any question about a pond that's not being used or won't be used in the future for agriculture. I'd register it. It sounds like Mr. Jordan, most people would know where they were anyway, but uh, perhaps code enforcement might have a slightly different interpretation. I don't know. There's no fee, town manager, to register a pond. You haven't set one. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can maintain your buildings, no problem, but if you want to add to them, you can't within 250 feet. No. No. No, can do it. 75. can do it. Yeah. You can do it. You can yes. add to them. Yes. All right. Yeah. How close to the water can you go? To the, to the, to the brook? Yeah, to the brook then. You're too close already. I, I know that. that. <laughs> <laughs> 75 feet, I believe. It is. 75 feet. If it's a farm building. If it's a farm right. building. Oh, there's a special, special permit for, for agriculture, yeah, 75 feet to the upland edge. Yeah. I call my house uh, where I live, farm or not. Seeing as I store stuff in the house from agriculture, is that going to be considered house? Is it's farm part building? of your business. I would, I would consider the, it. A, yeah, I wouldn't have a problem with that. No I'm not problem. the code enforcement officer. Ernie, any he, problem yet? He lives in it. It's a residence. And, and it would be the, the very end of that accessory structure that the 50-foot bubble would go out from. That's correct, providing the accessory structure was attached. And providing he doesn't feet. cross into a critical weapon. Right. You, you can do it, Joe. All right. <laughs> well, that's all I can think of right now. Thank you. Thank you. Well, 
Therefore, I'll close the public hearing. Public, yes, Mr. Lee. You were asked before by uh, Mr. Davis whether you could add some language that would clarify the criteria for the 250-foot buffer and the 100-foot buffer. As I understand the issue, it's a question of whether an area fell within both definitions, which would you apply, the 250 or the 100? Um, if you look on page 54, um, line 218, uh, two, two, 2018-18, uh, critical wetland zones that are distinctly separated from adjacent areas, it's clear that that is mutually exclusive to subparagraph 4 under the above criteria for 250-foot for buffers. So I see that definitionally that criteria is mutually exclusive. So the only question would be under double I under B, which is critical wetland zones within 250 feet of densely developed areas as defined herein. And I think the intent of the council is to state that you find a 250-foot buffer unless, however, you're near a densely developed area, in which case you can lessen the buffer. So what I would suggest is you add the following language above or above B. Notwithstanding any provisions of 19.306 paren 1, to the contrary, comma, a 100-foot buffer will be required. So that would say that notwithstanding the above 250-foot buffers, you can get a 100-foot buffer if you're near a densely developed area. So in other words, that's the one that wins out. That's preempted. I'll read it again. But that, in other words, the densely developed 100-foot buffer preempts the above 250-foot buffers. So in any case, if they would overlap, the landowner gets a 100-foot buffer. Notwithstanding any provision, I guess singular, any provision of 19306, one in paren to the contrary, comma, A, and then it continues, 100 foot buffer will be required. I think that just makes clear the priority of the 100 foot buffer when in doubt, or when there's an overlap, not when you're in doubt, but when there's a, you could be one or the other. I will review that with Mr. Davis. He thought that would uh, satisfy the concern that he raised. And, and the distinctly uh, separated area versus not well separated, that's always going to be a judgment call. That's correct. I, they're mutually exclusive as written. You know, how is it determined out in the field? Again, you, you, you're putting faith in your code, code enforcement officer here to go out and, and uh, determine it. Uh, but, but definitionally, they're, they're exclusive. Okay, thank you. Now we'll move on to item. 156, to consider a proposed amendment <coughs> to the zoning ordinance relating to wetlands protection and take any necessary action. Does anybody from the council have any comments? No, no. Vote it in the I, I would just start off the discussion by saying that I think there were two areas that were raised this evening regarding the appeal process by the citizens and then the area raised by Mr. Perry regarding equitability in terms of the buffer area as to whether or not something was in a subdivision and then they have 10 years to do something or if they weren't particularly in a subdivision that they, they don't have the two years are two areas that do concern me and need further, in my opinion, perusal to make this all the more equitable given that this is an evolutionary process. However, being that I am not able to kind of huddle with Tom Leahy in the corner to devise very important language that would need to be developed for amendments like this, I may be considering, you know, passage of this as it exists and then continuing my research into proposing amendments next, next uh, meeting or even if I'm off the council coming as a citizen to propose amendments uh, because I don't want to hold up this uh, ordinance and the amount of work based on those, but I also don't want to uh, devalue in any way the two very valid points that I thought were raised this evening. So that's kind of a beginning discussion point from my, my perspective here. Okay, thank you. Council Masterson. I, I agree with Councilor Latour. Um, I agree with Councilor Latour. Um, the Ordinance Committee has 
really been through the ringer on this one. On the one hand, we have individual homeowners pressing us. On the other, we have developers. On the one hand, we have farmers. On the other, we have those on postage stamp lots. Um, on one hand, we have those who want to rush this through, through because of a, a particular situation. On the other, I seem to de detect a certain amount of desire for foot dragging. And we have, the Ordinance Committee members have agreed that we are going to get something through. Something. It may not be perfect. It's gone through 23, 4 drafts. It's been in the process for two years. It's gone through the Conservation Commission, the Planning Board, the Ordinance Committee. The Council has workshopped it. Um, the time has come to take action, I believe. So um, I, I will make a motion that we um, adopt the ordinance as written, as amended uh, by the amendments that Councillor Creelman um, described tonight, plus the amendment that uh, Tom Leahy uh, proposed. I'll second that. Been moved and seconded. Is there any other discussion? Councillor McLaughlin. Mr. Chairman, I'm very concerned still about a number of items in this. I feel that it's always useful after the amount of scrutiny an ordinance such as this has gone through to get something on the books, live with it, see how it works in real life, and then come back and make your amendments as necessary. I think we're going to find a fair number of necessary amendments if we do pass this ordinance this evening. And I've been debating for a long time about how I would vote if a motion like this was made tonight. I think, however, it's my underlying feeling that this is becoming something too complicated and too expensive for this town to administer and to enforce. And I don't know that what we have is broken enough to put forth this kind of fix onto it. Thank you. Anybody else? I have, a, I have a couple of questions to the town attorney. Do you feel in your opinion that there isn't a significant change in what was posted for a public hearing to this audience with these amendments? Uh, Mr. Chairman, as I understand the question, um, once an ordinance has been set for public hearing and notice has been given to that effect, um, when you have a couple of amendments as you have had tonight, do you have to have a second public hearing or an additional public hearing? Um, I've given that a little thought, and my opinion is that the changes are not that substantial that would require another public hearing. The test is uh, whether, the, whether or not they are substantial. Um, given the breadth of this ordinance and the review that has had, that I don't believe the two changes and the clarification that I made are that substantial. Secondly, um, when determining what is substantial and what is not, uh, I would look partly to whether the changes make the ordinance less restrictive or more restrictive. I understand both amendments to make the ordinance less restrictive. Were they to go the other way and you were to, for example, bring in to uh, more severe restriction a broader area of land, which there are cases on that point, or uh, impose more severe restrictions on use of someone's land by the terms that I think would be, uh, I would recommend you have another public hearing. Uh, so the test is substantial, it's relative, I can't give you a guarantee, but I'm satisfied that, in my opinion, the changes that are part of um, the motion are not substantial and do not require a second or an additional public hearing. Thank you. You're, you're the expert. Uh, we have to go by that, but it's all right to disagree with an expert, isn't it? Sure. Thank you. Anybody else got a comment? Ready for the vote? 
One thing I think I'll propose, if it's agreeable to the council, that we have a roll call vote on this ordinance because it's kind of a crucial type document and we've been at it for quite a while. Is that in agreement with other members? Yeah, final name. Yeah, you love that. <laughs> okay, it's all yours. Chairman Jordan? No. Jane Amaro? Yes. Phyllis Cogsall? Yes. Wayne Creelman? Yes. Frank Latore? Yes. Nancy Masterton? Yes. Janet McLaughlin? No. <laughs> we have five yes and two no. Thank you. So we have something that I hope will be changed in the next year or so. Item 157, we'll take up 157 because I think there's some interested people here. And after that, I would appreciate if uh, fellow members would take a few minute break. To consider the adoption of proposed zoning wetland map and take any necessary action. Does anyone care to make a motion? Mr. Chairman, I would move that the town council does adopt the map as has been talked about this evening uh, simply as an interim map uh, and that at the same time we request uh, that at our October 1990 town council meeting that all of the subdivisions as of July 1st 1990 would be included uh, that all citizen input that that we have received this evening in the uh, second public hearing as well as any and all further information uh, and input be updated with respect to the map and that again a special reminder uh, be set forth that again this map is suggestive only uh, for wetland purposes. Move and second. Anyone else got any comment? Yes. Yeah. Just as part of that, you, you may request that the town clerk attest and date the map so that it's, it's clear which one we're talking about. So moved. Anybody else got any comment? If not, all those in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed, it's a vote. Yes, who, Council the vote? Who was the vote, Mr. Chairman? Seven to nothing. Okay. That wasn't important enough to roll call, huh? No. It's a lousy map. You should have a lousy well, vote. I thought you'd want that Council one. Council <laughs> Yes. Jeff is allowed for the We hope to, yeah. What we hope to do is work with the Cape Courier to lay out within the next 30 days uh, the process for doing that, uh, with some and develop some specific forms and other materials so that the, everyone can follow a fairly standard procedure. Are we going to make an attempt to notify other people who own ponds that are known but might not be aware of the changes in the ordinance? We will make an attempt to, but we will not guarantee that we will necessarily find everyone because there's no way of, of knowing that we do catch them. I would hope that we would come up with a document that a form that everyone would use the same to have it and how not everybody come in with a different type. I think on, on that point I think we'll also develop a form for specific recommendations anyone wants to make for amendments to the map so that they can all be considered uh, on an equal basis. Thank you. Good enough? Thanks. What I would like to do at this point, I know there's people here waiting to be on the agenda, but I would like to propose a five-minute recess at this point. Are the rest in agreement? Yes, very much so. Thank you.
Next on the agenda is item 158 to consider a report from the Municipal Facilities Committee relating to space needs for the Department of Public Works and take any necessary action. I believe you all received some info in your packet about the work the Facilities Committee has done and uh, we have the chairman of the committee here this evening to give us uh, a little overview of their thinking and uh, therefore I'll ask uh, Irv Chapel to uh, the chairman of the committee to kick it off. Good morning to you all. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the uh, Facilities Management Committee started in January and we've been meeting for about three months and uh, like any committee we decided to take the easiest job first which was the public works uh, garage department vehicles and so forth and uh, we've got that done and then with your good graces why we'll go on to the uh, fire and police department uh, starting April 19th. We got a hell of a committee. It, it's really something like you never saw before in your life and I've been here a long time at Cape Elizabeth. I've got the fire chief, I got the police chief, I got the public works director, I got the town manager, I got two architects, one land and one building. I got a builder. I got a businessman. I got a former fire department chief and uh, works on buildings at his work. And me. And it really works out good. I don't have to do a darn thing. This report here is all done by the rest of them. They send it to me for your approval. I don't read it. I just sign it. So if you've got anything that you don't like, why well, see the fire chief the police chief, the public works director, or the town manager. You've all read the report, and you all like it. No. And if you don't, why, you've got to have a good reason. Under two recommendations, after going through all of the buildings that the public work has, looking at the building, looking at their vehicles, looking at the personnel, looking at their needs as you requested us to do, we have come up with the following recommendations. We reviewed alternatives for providing space for the public works and can find no compelling reason to move from the present location. We're thinking of the taxpayers, we're thinking of the town there. You have a building that's perfectly serviceable with a few additions to it, good location right in the center, and we could see no reason to even think about putting it somewhere else or a new building. That one is good with a little work. In addition to the building of approximately 1,500 to 2,000 square feet will provide us the space needed to correct the deficiencies and take care of our long-range plans. Your deficiencies, as you notice, are listed for you in the first part of the uh, setup here that you've got before you. Three, the present building is very serviceable and with moderate modifications would be suitable for long-term occupancy. We can see no reason the committee along with the staff that's worked with us, why that present building, uh, with the addition, would not take care of us for the next 10, 15, 20 years. Four, we strongly recommend the high school access road should be relocated so that all of the highway department parking is on the same side rather than two sides of the road. After reviewing all of the above, baloney, baloney, we recommend 100% all of us that uh, you adopt this 
and let the public works director uh, and the town manager get hold of an architect, get this thing started, and get the addition going. Any questions? Yes, sir. Yes, could someone speak to the, to the basic um, <clears throat> difference with respect to the proposed 1,600 square foot addition versus the 2,000? I mean, it's 400 square feet difference. But can someone speak to that? Because there is a considerable amount of money uh, different there. Sure can. Don't forget now, uh, we had the same problem uh, all the time that we were meeting. Everybody had it. I had it, and the uh, architects had it. We were given the job of looking at the buildings in the town and finding the best way to correct them if there were deficiencies and the least cost effective. We were not going to do uh, uh, rooms, uh, bathrooms, offices, stairways, location of the addition, location of parking, none of that. Generalities only, because you're going to hire an architect to tell you this was for your information only. It's a preliminary project budget, not a project budget, and we put this together so you could get an idea that you had not less than a $200,000 addition and not more than a five hundred, dollars and that's what that page is for. Your architect will take you through that and will break it down so that you'll have a much better idea. Take certain figures in there. I know what you're talking because I had the same question because I'm not an architect. Uh, $5,000 for civil engineering. That's high. It won't take that. Does that help you a little bit on how I'm thinking? <clears throat> yes, the, the only, the basic, I guess I had one question, and that is when you take the grand total dollars difference, we're talking about what, roughly uh, $30,000. And pro proportionately, is the $30,000 difference uh, appropriate to basically a 20% increase in square footage? Is that how it works in architectural circles? Is that an appropriate uh, uh, relationship? Yes, sir. Okay. That's all I wanted to know. Yep. I hope I, that clears it up because, as I say, I had the same problem. We, we were to put something together for you for a large picture of what we thought would work. We're not a building committee. We're not uh, your final setup. From this, you'll say, yes, that sounds good. We'll get an architect, and away we go. Thank you. Council Madison? Um, Irv, uh, is the room for 2,000 square feet, are you talking about one floor, two stories? Or this is one story. One story. Yes. There is room for yes. 2,000. Yep. Thank you. Definitely. In fact, uh, we had the plans, uh, but that's why I wouldn't put them in this, if you follow me. We had to have something to work with, so we had, uh, you know, not just a rough sketch of what we would like to do. But we didn't want to take an architect that you may hire, or tell the town manager to hire, and have him say, Gee, I'm restricted here. You've given them a plan. The, the council's approved it. You've got this here. You've got that there. No, that 2,000 is room for it and will take care of the things that need to be done. Council Latore. Just on the overview once again, is this part of an ongoing study that you're going to be doing of other public, uh, municipal facilities as well? This is kind of like a phase one, your first recommendation regarding public yeah. works, and there's more coming. Yes. I mean, you're going to get all these people to work again so you can sign your name to it and we can be happy with yeah. it. And good. Yeah. Okay. So we had to get this one in because they, they want to get going, and that's the department that has you need of something right away. Everything else is operating. Your police is operating fine. We can arrest people tonight, and your fire department is working great. We can put out fires tonight. But <laughs> Highway needed some work right away. And being the easiest one, why, we tackled it. They couldn't plow roads tomorrow if it's snowed? We could with your help. Yes, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Council Amro. Uh, I guess that was that you really answered my question. I was going to say how urgent is it that this be done? So you're proposing that this be done in the coming fiscal year. Oh, I would say that I would do it just as fast as you can. You've got a, have you been over there? Mm -hmm. yes. You've seen where the men uh, sit down to have a sandwich? Yes. You've seen where they have to go at the boys' room? You've seen the office, you've seen the stairs, a cri old crippled man like me, you can't make those stairs without help. And so you've got problems, real problems, and they should be addressed right away. And code problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we're not going to shut the building down, but if you don't do something, we might just scare you, you know? <laughs> <laughs> those stairs got uh, history in them, come out of the fort. Council McLaughlin. Uh, you've done a fine job, Irv, you and your committee. I do have a number of questions for you, though. <laughs> Um, when the code enforcement officer reviewed this, 
He was quoting from the 1976 Boca Code. Are there any significant revisions in the 1990 Boca Code that no. would make more revisions necessary to the building? We were, we, as I say, we were very fortunate on the committee to have two architects. Right. And the land architect brought in things like you see down here, has this waste survey, all those little things. He's great. Yes, yes. And uh, so, yes, between the two architects, they have kind of brought us up to date of things that they're finding on all things that they're doing now. Mm -hmm. School departments, building. The, in fact, one of them just finished a uh, fire station. So, I mean, yes, yes, they've been brought up to date. Are you uh, proposing air conditioning other than the break room and the conference room? Uh, wait a minute, say that again? Are you proposing air conditioning to be in any place besides the break room and the conference room? I'm not proposing that it be anywhere except we need some. Yeah, I don't want to get too specific. Yeah, okay, I hear you on that. Yeah. You say you found no compelling reason to move from the present location. Yeah, Absolutely. What about, what about proximity to the schools? It won't make any difference when we finally get done. Okay. I would say I imagine the town planner was pleased <coughs> to be made aware of your recommendation that the high school access road be relocated. I <laughs> hope that our town manager uh, has been keeping people informed. If he hasn't, why, we'll speak to him. Okay. Um, how does your report coincide with the town center concept that the Main Street 90 committee is looking at? Mike, how does that work out? I'm not sure exactly. The, the Main Street 90 committee has not specifically uh, commented upon this plan. We have made the chairman of the subcommittee on the town center aware of the continued planning. I've had a number of discussions with him. Uh, they haven't taken an official position one way or the other. Similarly, if, if this plan is uh, something that the uh, council would like to continue on, uh, it, it is something uh, we'd want to formally uh, show to the school board so that they would be fully aware of it and uh, of the plans. So thus far, we've only had some preliminary discussions with uh, uh, school department administrators, but to my, to my knowledge, the board itself is not aware uh, of it. Okay, I bring that up because that was part of the committee charge to coordinate with the Main Street 90 <coughs> Town Center subcommittee. Yeah. They have had discussions with them, but... Okay. Thank you. Okay. Council, Council Matheson. Um, I'm interested in, in the, the timing of this. Can you hear me, Irv? Yeah, I'm listening. Um, when, do you, when do you think you'll get your police station, and what was the other? The, fire. Uh, police and fire. Fire and police, yeah. Uh, when will we get the uh, report to you? Yes. Oh, between one and three years. That help you? <coughs> Did you have a deadline? No, no. I, I wish they'd give us one and we could all quit, but uh, no, there's no deadline given uh, that I know of, except we will stop. Have you got a deadline, Janet? Yeah. No, you've got a deadline. Yeah. Good. What uh, is well, it? Well, the reason that I'm asking this question is that I'm thinking of the financing and that if you had um, additional expenditures involved with the police and fire station, um, that you might want to put a bond package together in, in, in association with the roofs. Our, our discussions have been that we, we see the addressing of the police and fire needs at least two, two years away. Uh, the only reason they came up at this time with this particular study committee was to be sure that, was that whatever was done with public works didn't foreclose the possibility of anything in the, the public safety area. We, they've looked at everything including using the, the public works garage as a fire station as a public safety building. And, you know, as Irv has mentioned, they came back to the you know, we've already got a terrific public work type investment there and relocating the, the public works uh, would be prohibitively expensive. Uh, as for, for bonding, uh, it would be my recommendation that uh, this project uh, be authorized for bonding uh, at an appropriate time and uh, if at all possible to include it uh, with a school, de school department uh, bond uh, if you should uh, approve uh, a bond for the school department as well. Okay. Council Latori. Well, I see our esteemed uh, Director of Public Works in the audience. Maybe I'd have him come up and answer. Just, <coughs> when you're looking at something like this, how far out do you think this would serve us in terms of, of projected growth of the town, projected population growth, thus probably n need for more trucks, more, more people, et cetera? Did you 
project out as to how far you think it would serve us this type of a, of a renovation? Or either Irv, and then maybe Bob could comment. Go ahead, Bob. Yeah. Can I steal the podium for a second? You, sure, you can have it. <laughs> We looked at that, and uh, you know, we looked at the developments and possibly speak adding on trucks. Excuse me. Would you speak into the microphone? Certainly. <laughs> and uh, we felt that the space we had there was adequate for for future growth. We weren't looking at a whole lot of growth, as mm -hmm. far as equipment needs. I mean, would you say like a decade? Definitely. At least at, a decade. At least. Oh, definitely. Okay, because I mean, you know, the bottom line is we don't want to sink three hundred thousand dollars into something that we're going to outgrow in five years right. or. It is not you you know, not properly. But again, utilized. you know, we looked at the possibility of moving the entire facility, and you're talking fuel tanks, and like the manager said, it'd be very cost prohibitive to do that. Okay. Thank you, Council McGough. If the manager could help me understand what kind of deadline this committee has or has had in the past. Uh, this committee was uh, supposed to provide a preliminary report to the town council on or about this date. I, I don't remember the exact date. Mm -hmm. And I believe their final report is due between now and the end of the year. Uh, at, at their last meeting, they had a discussion about uh, how rushed do they need to be. And uh, they were hoping that uh, they could slack off a little bit because uh, they've really been out straight on this work, uh, meeting several times a month and uh, as well as meeting on the outside individual committee members uh, doing follow-up work. So, you know, there is a possibility the charge might have to be amended at some point to give them more time uh, to study those other areas. And they particularly, as, as they get into the fire issue, uh, they, they're coming up with more alternatives than uh, anyone would ever think possible. So uh, it is going to take quite a bit of time to really figure out both the needs and uh, the solutions toward those needs. They, they're still having a real debate on what the needs are. I find they're doing a very thorough job, mm -hmm. and I appreciate that, and I know how time-consuming that could be, and I certainly would not be adverse to extending the deadline, but there will be a deadline at some point. If you make Thank it the end of the year, it'll be all right, but you won't have a report. I want to be realistic. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? You all set on that side? I have a couple questions for you. Probably I will get the information at a later date, but uh, the road that you want to put in as far as the school department, and I understand by the manager that you've discussed it with the staff but not with the school board, so on and so forth. Is that correct? And I'm concerned, uh, those trees in your thoughts, whether they stay or go down, they're not. We get a look at that at a later date? What? The trees, whether they stay or go. We're not touching the trees. You're not touching the trees. Okay, good. I'm glad to hear that. that you no buildings. Yes, okay. one. One thing in the, maybe I'll give this to the public works director. In your new construction, why do the women lockers need more room than the men? You're going to employ some females? You never know. It says 90 to 120, and the men have 120, 160. I think those are just general ranges at the just architect. General yeah, ranges, yeah, very okay. general, very general. Okay. Well, we don't want to overdo it. No. <laughs> the men have more than the women in this plan. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Mm. Okay. You're right. I was taking numbers. We wanted to provide for both if the case arose. Okay. Get the swing on. Anybody? I'll read the item. If anybody would care to make a motion. Item 158, to consider a report from the Municipal Facilities Committee relating to the space needs for the Department of Public Works and taking necessary action. Mr. Chairman, I yes. we'll move that we acknowledge receipt of this excellent report from uh, the Municipal Facilities Committee. Second. Been moved and seconded. Any other questions? All in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed? So opposed, seven to none. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Yes. 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 Oh, you could you? stay. We enjoy your coming. We could could I ask a question? Here. Yes. Go ahead. I assume that motion, uh, the, it's the intent of the council for me to come back with a plan for implementation for you to, for you to then review and determine uh, how far you want to take implementation. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Fine. Thank you. 
Item 159, to consider a request from, from Lester and Henrietta Lombard to vacate a proposed public way taking a necessary action. I believe the manager is going to open that up, and I think you all received a letter from them, and you see it received a little map in your packet. I'd be happy to, to uh, introduce this topic. I'd also like to point out that Mrs. Henrietta Lombard is here as well to answer any questions uh, that you may have. Uh, the Lombards approached me, it must be th three or four months ago now, to see if it would be possible to vacate a portion of Manter Street. Uh, Manter Street is part of a 1902 subdivision uh, called Manter Heights. Uh, there's, there's approximately a 200-foot section of road that you, have, you can see before you on a map that runs from the intersection of Alder Street and Manter <coughs> Street up to the, the intersection of Chevrous Road, uh, Mitchell Road, and <coughs> the, the so-called Manter Street that doesn't really exist. If any of you have been down to look at the area, you, you would have noted uh, that it, it is an extremely dangerous spot for another road to come out. And in, in fact, you know, by today's standards, the, the town would, would never want a road uh, in this particular uh, location. Uh, as, as it now stands, the area is primarily used uh, for parking uh, for uh, each of the, the two major abutting property owners on the, on the upper side of it. And on the lower side, it's uh, uh, a slope and a, a wooded area. Uh, the process uh, for vacating uh, provides you have to first give notice to the planning board. Uh, after giving notice to the planning board, uh, you would then uh, entertain uh, the possibility of ordering a, a vacation. Uh, once you order the vacation, uh, notice then has to be sent to each property owner uh, of the 1902 subdivision and an amount indicating uh, what damages are due, if any. Uh, it's my feeling that no damages uh, would ultimately be due uh, because it, 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 this piece of land really has no value uh, uh, to the subdivision, it, as the subdivision uh, now stands uh, in 1990. Uh, Mrs. Lombard, uh, along with a friend of hers, uh, has done quite a bit of work uh, listing the property owners and doing the necessary title work uh, that would enable us to continue to prepare the notices. Uh, she, she also has spoken to uh, the one other property owner uh, who abuts this uh, other than uh, the Lombard Devizes and the Lombard, Mr. and Mrs. Lombard, and that gentleman is uh, Lawrence Lydon, Jr., the third. I call him Young Larry. He's, you can figure out which one that is. And uh, he, he, as I understand it, uh, has no objection to this. So I would uh, ask that you, you provide the official notice to the Capitals of the Planning Board and uh, and uh, there's a draft uh, before you on the podium this evening to do that, and that uh, you otherwise uh, table this uh, to your next meeting and request a planning. Actually, you just have to provide notice to the planning board. You don't necessarily have to have a response back, but put the planning board on notice that this will be on your agenda uh, for next month. That would be my recommendation to you. Thank you. Anyone got a comment? Councilor Mass. Michael, uh, just a question. Um, is Manter Street accepted by the town? The remaining portion of Manter Street is, is uh, extending from Mitchell Road uh, to Alder Street. It was accepted about two years ago, maybe. May I ask um, Henrietta a question? Would you mind answering your question? She'd be glad to. You, Would you? you have to come up. <laughs> Since you've been sitting here, it seems we ought to put you to work, Henrietta. Oh, thank you. Um, as you know, I've been to your place many a time, and I've been in the greenhouse and bought beautiful flowers from Lester. Um, I, I do not recall this, this little stretch of land, and the statement that was made that cars were parked on it. The driveway is this is that our driveway is the street, is the paper street, our driveway. Between oh. the greenhouse and my house is the p portion we're talking about. Is the about. street, aha, uh -huh. okay. Well, that clears up my problem. That is the street between our property. They're both of the houses. The greenhouse is on one corner. There's on the corner of 
Manta Street and Chevis Road, and we're on the corner of Manta Street and Mitchell Road. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you. Don't go away. Maybe somebody else will have some right. questions. Councilor McLaughlin. I don't have any questions for oh, you. Oh, I thought you had your hand up. <laughs> I did, but I don't have any questions for you. Thank you. Councilor Tory. If there's further questions, I was going to propose the motion. Maybe Jane wants no, to. Just one question. If, if this land is no longer part of Manter Street, then uh, who, who uh, owns this land? Who will own this land once it's vacated, once the right of way is? It, it divides down the middle and goes to each of the abutting property owners in, in uh, equal portions. That You divide it right down the half. So your property abuts both sides of it, except for that one area where the line is. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone care to make Mr. a motion? Chairman. Councilor Tory. I would move that the following notice uh, be sent to the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board. A petition has been filed with the municipal offices of the town of Cape Elizabeth, Maine, proposing to vacate the following way shown upon a subdivision plan named Manter Heights dated April 1902 and recorded in the Cumberland County Registry of Deeds, Book of Plans, Volume 9, page 119. The unaccepted portion of Manter Street extending southerly approximately 200 feet from the intersection of Manter Street and Alder Street to the intersection of Chevrolet Road, Mitchell Road, and said Manter Street. Second. Been moved and seconded. Any other questions? All those in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed, it's a vote. Seven to nothing. Thank you. I think we also need to table this item to our next regular meeting in the, for council action on it. Do we have to have a public? Don't we wait back for the, we, we to wait to hear back. We don't have to. We don't. The planning board doesn't have to take any action. Oh, they just have to be okay. notified. Do we have a public hearing on this? Okay, Mr. Chairman, I move that we table this item to our regular May meeting. Second. And moved and seconded. Any other questions? All in favor? Raise your hand. Those opposed? Seven to nothing. Item 160, to consider a proposed amendment to the code ordinance, code of ordinance <coughs> regarding manufactured housing taking necessary action. Steve Etzel, the vice chairman of the planning board is here to, to briefly uh, outline the uh, planning board's uh, actions on this item. Mr. Chairman, uh, council and staff members, uh, Dick Tinsman has asked me to stand in and uh, briefly summarize uh, some of the um, aspects of the Manufactured Housing Park Ordinance that we're proposing. Uh, there are basically two major tasks that were set forth by the state statute. Uh, one to designate the areas within a town <coughs> that permit mobile home parks to expand and to be developed in a number of environmentally suitable locations in the municipality. And number two, to enact the performance standards pertaining to mobile home uh, parks detailed in the new law. Um, the ordinances we've proposed to the council um, covers five major topics, the allowing of uh, individual manufactured housing units to continue to be located in the RA, and these are manufactured units themselves, uh, in the RA and RC zoning uh, districts, uh, to allow manufactured housing parks to be located only in the RC zoning district, uh, setting uh, state, sta uh, state statute mandated minimum uh, lot areas uh, ranging from 6,500 uh, to 20,000 square feet uh, in that RC district, uh, providing for open space dedication and buffering where allowed by the state law and requiring the ground water assessment uh, studies for manufactured housing parks uh, not served by public water and sewer. Uh, we spent uh, several months um, studying both combining the state statute, which is a very detailed, uh, pretty much free of any loopholes, uh, statute in combining with the planning concerns of this municipality. Uh, I hope the council finds the ordinance uh, to be comprehensive and, and sufficient. Uh, I think if there are any initial questions, either on the format or some of the basic uh, uh, 
items of substance, I'll, I'll try to answer some of those. Thank you. Anybody got a question? Uh, Steve? Yes, Council Cloud Show. The planning board held a public hearing, is that correct? According yes. to the letter. Uh, were you present? At, were you on the board at Was that, that one of the workshops? No, it's a regular Yes, I must. Uh, was it? My, my question is. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. If it was February, but, I don't know. But the public mm -hmm. comments were. No one showed up. But they were definitely there for that particular hearing and left. Okay. Thank you. That's why I. There was properly <laughs> properly <laughs> notice, right? No one, no the one notice went out properly and everything. Councilor <laughs> Creamer. Steve, I remember <clears throat> listening to the discussion uh, with the planning board members on this particular issue. And you have a new member uh, on the planning board who very uh, eloquently discussed at great length a variety of these issues. Uh, would it be possible for him to join the ordinance committee at the time we uh, look over this particular document? He seemed to have a particular expertise that I would find quite valuable. Um, the new member's name is Tom Emery, okay. and uh, he has an interest in sitting down with the ordinance uh, committee. Uh, and we suggested that at the public uh, planning board meeting. Um, he does, the number of those suggestions were very good. Uh, some contradicted the state statute, uh, which again is a very tight drawn uh, statute. Uh, others were, were simply good suggestions. And yes, I'm sure he'd gladly join you. Anybody else? Do a care? Anyone care to make a motion? Mr. Chairman. Councilor Tory. I move that we would send this uh, proposed ordinance to the ordinance committee. Second. And moved and second. And he, the chairman has smiles. He's waiting. Yes, I see. Nothing to do. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else got a comment? We don't want moss Push. growing under their feet, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> we have signs. All those in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed? So vote, seven to nine. Item 161, to consider reacting an emergency ordinance adopted in January related to manufactured housing and taking necessary action. I believe that you, uh, you want to give a little outline of why I, we're doing this? I think the cover sheet on item number 161 is self-explanatory. Anybody have a comment, question? Anybody care to make a motion? Mr. Chairman, I move that we reenact the emergency uh, ordinance on manufactured housing. Do we hear a second? Second. Shouldn't we, for the record, give reasons for, for the enacting an emergency ordinance? Uh, well, because this is a reenactment. Right. Uh, how shall I do this? Shall I modify my amend of my motion? Excuse if you me. included all these talk. whereas, yeah. I think um, it would be really helpful. Read. Okay. Um, as explained and ordered by the emergency uh, emergency ordinance as presented because of the um, expiration of the 90-day uh, emergency ordinance uh, uh, life, and we're not ready for a, you know, to enact a, a permanent one. If the council the feels we have the don't feel that that's uh, a very decent motion. We have the appropriate whereases. I'd be happy to second the frontispiece page of item 161 as per uh, Council Masterton's discussion. Any other questions? Comments? Councilor Kramer. Yeah, just like to make one uh, point uh, to my fellow councilors. My understanding is that if we do not get at least a five to two vote, uh, the motion will not pass and we will be out of compliance with state statute. Is that correct, Mr. Manager? I believe it is. Yes. For emergency yes. purposes. And there are yes. state officials waiting outside ready to arrest us. I just thought I would inform my fellow counselors. What are you doing, Tristan Maya? Anybody else got a comment? All those in favor? 
Please raise your hand. Those opposed? So vote. Seven to nothing. You can leave now. You know, the state officials. Item 162, to consider proposed burial fees for Riverside Memorial Cemetery and take any necessary action. I believe uh, Town Clerk Debbie Pizzo is going to give us some info on this. Is that correct? Yes. Recently we requested bid proposals for burials in Riverside Cemetery. This would cover uh, the 1990 and 1991 burial season. Jerry Murray was a low bidder. Um, there are really two increases from last year. That would be an adult burial on Saturdays and holidays and a cremation burial on Saturdays and holidays. I am happy that we did not have to increase the adult burial weekdays, which is the majority of our burials. Um, these fees are now ready for council approval. Anyone want to have a comment? Yes, Councilor Creamer. Yes, Debbie, I'm just a little confused. The uh, <clears throat> item 162 that we received indicated that uh, the fees on the front page there as set forth would be the recommended fees. On the Xerox accepted bid, I, I believe that's Gerald Murray's bid. Now, he, he bids less. What, what does that mean? Each year that we receive the bid, we increase it just a bit for our administrative fees. I see. So even though it's less, we're, we're voting on these prices, on the front, on yeah, the front yeah. prices. Okay. Anybody else? Councilman McLaughlin. Mr. Chairman, I move that we approve the burial fees as presented to us this evening. I'll second. And moved and seconded. Any other comment? All in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed? It's a vote. Something to nothing. Item 163, to consider <coughs> proposed amendments to Riverside Memorial Cemetery rules and take any necessary action. I believe you all received some uh, info in your packet, and we have the chairman of the uh, cemetery committee present, and I believe I'll ask him to come up and make a few comments, and uh, we can answer any questions. Mr. Chairman, uh, Councilors, uh, some time ago we, uh, the committee of the Riverside Cemetery was asked to uh, look over the rules and regulations at the request of the, uh, the uh, town clerk, who of course is the prime administrator of the cemetery. With some difficulties that uh, they were having with, uh, she was having with uh, administering the rules. And uh, number one has to do with the purchase of uh, space in the cemetery by other than not <clears throat> other than residents or non-resident taxpayers um, we tried to close that up a little bit you'll notice in if you look at the first section of the rules and regulations um, the town of Cape Elizabeth will not buy back any lots that become available so that if someone has lots that they'd like to sell uh, they're almost forced to sell to any buyer they can find whether they're residents or non-residents so it seems to us that one of our first steps should be to clean that, uh, clean that up to allow the town to buy back available space. Yes. Uh, I think that that's a good suggestion. But I wondered why are you recommending that the town only buy back the space at 75 percent of the cost? Well, uh, or the present, the going. Cost? I feel that, uh, and and the board agrees the, that the purchase back price. Um, should be first of all should be high enough to make it worthwhile to sell back so that the town can perpetuate the space so we want to encourage people to sell back to the town yet if you pay at the current rate in other words there there are expenses the town incurs taking care of even on used spaces because they have to be mowed and taken care of so uh, we felt there was a there shouldn't be a 100 um, percent purchase and we settled on a 75 does that answer what your concerns are? Yeah, I guess so. I still am not sure why you wouldn't pay the current rate. Because then, well, oh, oh, I'm sorry. You, you uh, want also. discussion on an hour? Well, no, I was going to. Councilman McLaughlin? No. No? Well, Councilman Latour? I wanted to let him finish. Then. I wanted to let him finish. <laughs> well, with that, with that particular piece, uh, uh, that item, I think I'm finished. 
<laughs> oh. We have, we have a couple others, you know, other sections of the rules, but um, perhaps if I could clear that. The 75 percent was, a, it wasn't a number that we just picked out of the air. We discussed uh, 40 percent, uh, 50 percent. Um, there were some concerns that there's a possibility of making a profit uh, from this. Uh, also, that um, if you happen to buy uh, a cemetery lots just before a price increase, certainly you could sell it back at double what you paid for it. You, because we have a tendency to wait a long time before we increase prices. We generally increase by large percentages. So there, are, there is profit-making uh, opportunities there if anyone wanted to uh, look at that. But. Thank you. Can, can we get just, again, just a clarification of who presently can buy a lot? It's, you must be a Cape Elizabeth resident. Or a non-resident taxpayer, or it can be at the discretion of the trustees. In other words, if you're a long-term resident, moved away and wanted to be buried at Riverside, you could make a formal written request to the trustees. Mm -hmm. They take it on a case-by-case -case basis. Is there any stipulation of once you buy and you're going to resell it, who you can resell it to? Could you? Could you resell it to a person who's never been in Cape Elizabeth? That's correct. Currently, as the rules are written, there is, there is no provision, again, for the town to buy it back. We have had several instances since I've been here that folks have sold to non-residents or to friends or what have you. And, of course, we would like to have that control back to sell it to residents and their families. Yeah, I, I believe that it should be, that we should be able to buy it back, but at the price that it was purchased at, so that no... I mean, it, it may sound silly to talk about land speculation here, but if you're allowed to make a profit, why, why don't I go in and buy up 10 of them and, you know, just wait and hold on and hold on and hold on? I know the town's going to automatically buy it back at whatever it's risen, 75% of whatever it's risen, and I did some math on that, and you can make a very nice profit on that. And I think that's wrong, absolutely wrong. You're going to pay, you're going, you want to pay what the, the what, price what that you, the What you paid. bought it for. How about if you limited it to the... See, what I'm afraid of is that... As the time goes on, uh, some of the, the lots in that cemetery were bought for $50 for an eight-grave lot. And they're still in the families of folks that could sell them back. And in that case, you'd be paying uh, $10, $12 for a lot. Mm. You see, that's what I mean. I want to make it, you, you need to make it valuable enough so that people, because you want to buy those lots back. You want to perpetuate that space. Yeah, I see what you're saying, but as these spaces get more and more valuable, because they, you know, they're limited, and people, you know, we've run into the problem already. I think where President Bush had trouble getting into the Kennebunkport Cemetery, et cetera, those kind of things, they seem they seem far fetched to us now, but these could get more valuable as time goes on. Oh, and I could see will. I could see major speculation going on. on it. it just bothers me. That's a gruesome way to make a turn a profit. <laughs> <laughs> I, I personally don't think that it, that. It is something that anybody have to worry about as far as anyone making. I'm sure there's lots of ways to make a better profit than buying lots in cemetery and resell, waiting for the price to increase and sell them. But I, I, I would like to make underhanded the, people. I would like to make the 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 uh, purchase the buyback price large enough so that it would encourage people to sell those lots back, so that we will have, the town can have more uh, lots in the pool, so to speak, to uh, to sell and make that space last longer because it's. Uh, 200 years from now, 500 years from now, we all, the whole town will be cemetery. We have many lots. I, I'm not uh, uh, sure of all of them, but I'm sure in the older part of the cemetery, when years ago when they sold eight graves at a time, that you bought them an eight grave lot, uh, there might be two uh, two burials on that lot. The other six spaces are wasted. And okay. I'll, I, I would be willing to say there's many spaces like that in Riverside Cemetery. Councilor Abra. How many uh, lots are there still available? I can't answer that. We did a study back some time ago. I believe Debbie can take care of that. There's Council Masson. Um, how, how are you going to proceed with this, uh, providing we pass this uh, tonight? Um, are you going to uh, write to owners of let's call it inactive <coughs> lots um, and make a proposal to individuals? Hadn't considered that. Well, okay. it seems to me that if it's desirable to uh, recapture otherwise unused space, it seems to me that you have to know what the situation is in each lot or family lot 
and that the only way that you can do that is to notify the owners of the town's desire to recapture the lot if they're willing to sell. Well, I don't you think have to do a kind of a promotional job. Little little advertising. That well, uh, we hadn't thought of that. I think the the idea was that as the space from starting now became available, uh, that if if we had, we presently, we said that anyone could buy, uh, could sell a lot to anyone they want to. It supposedly is going to be approved by the Board of Trustees before any sale is made. But uh, if someone is moving to California and they want to sell the space, they want to sell it now. We also could help them sell it. We might know someone who is going to buy two, if you read through that first section, that's inten the way it was intended was that the, the town would act as a middleman, if you will, but in the sale of this property. But they weren't going to buy it back. And occasionally, there are there are uh, spaces become available. Debbie, if I may, I have been keeping a list since I've been here of those folks that want to sell the lots back or sell them. And of course, we haven't had the mechanism to do that. Matter of fact, Friday I received a call from a woman who bought lots 20 years ago and has two available to sell back, and I just told her to hold tight and hopefully that we'd be able to buy them back from her. So I have been keeping those lists, and I will contact those folks. Do we, Debbie, do we have a budget for this? It's in or the, uh, uh, ask the manager. We have the Riverside Trust Fund, and we come out of the trust fund. Or we come out of the trust fund. Can and you? OK, go ahead. The number of lots that were originally available in the cemetery were about 2,470. We have about 675 left. De De Council De Quayla. Debbie, would, would you see this revised uh, provision here whereby the sale of lots to any other person then would be prohibited and the town would then be the only purchasing agent, so to speak? I mean, do you see that as basically a, a, a huge benefit to the current owners of lots who may want to dispose of them, or do you see that in a sense as a, uh, how should I say, an intrusion on the right to do what they want to with their lots pending the trustees okay? Not only do I see it for a benefit um, of that lot owner to be able to sell it back to us, but it's for their benefit and our benefit because we asked for that original deed back. It's to prevent any future heirs of that lot to come back if a, maybe a private sale is done and the town is not notified of it. That, you know, that's very scary to me to think that maybe some transaction occurred that we never knew about. This gives us that control that there's going to be one person with a deed for each lot. Okay. Does anybody else get a comment? Well, I, I Council? A clarification okay. for, yes. for this side of the table. Uh, that, so now Cape Elizabeth is the only one that you can sell it to? Yeah. You no longer may sell it to family, friend, or has this been checked with the Attorney General in terms of restraint of trade? No. I'll put it this way. If someone came and said that they wanted to sell it to a family member or whatnot, it would go through our channels, and I don't see any reason why we could not um, save, if you will, those two uh, lots for that family member to buy. We're not you know, going to prevent anyone. You know, from but an independent them. deal can't, can't happen that without actually town Actually, now it, we require the original deed back. We don't um, have anything to do with the money or what have you, but again, getting back to the fact that we need to know who has uh, possession of those and who has the burial rights to those deeds, uh, to those lots. Okay. I got a question to you, Wayne, that, uh, that's come up lately about somebody that is born and lived in Cape Elizabeth a good number of years, and like the one that uh, has come to mind, went in the service from Cape Elizabeth, but when he came back, he couldn't find a place in his uh, price range, so he moved somewhere else. <coughs> and have lived there for 20 years or so. Did you ever consider those people as uh, have a right to buy a lot in the cemetery or not? Have they ever considered that? Uh, those are the, uh, they, they are considered and there has been several requests made to the board. The uh, consensus of the board since I've been on it is that in reading the, here again, the board uses these regulations to um, make their decisions as well as, as the town clerk. The first couple of sentences in the uh, regulations under the purchase of lots would lead one to believe that the lots are to be sold to, to uh, residents and non-residents. And even the uh, sentence that stipulates that others may be uh, considered by the Board of Trustees 
it's still pretty strong that the, to me anyway, that the intention of the, uh, is that the, the land is to be perpetuated for residents and non-residents. Uh, and the family considerations, you'll notice if you read through there, there isn't any, any consideration. There's no mention of family or ancestors or that sort of thing, which is I'm sure what you have in mind. Yeah, they have family that's there now. I, th I would hope that your group would reconsider that, discuss it again, because I think it's valuable for people that went in the service and whatever. you. Thank you. Anybody else? Do we, do we get a motion? You've got two other parts of it. We have, we, that's, that's section one. That's, yeah. that's the uh, purchase of lots. The second piece is, uh, has to do with uh, when the cemetery is open, and it's uh, under the section under interments, section two of the, of the rules and regulations. And we, we've had, uh, what was intended here is the uh, town clerk needs a little more uh, strength in the, the uh, discouragement of uh, burials over Memorial Day weekend. Uh, you'll notice that right now that uh, there will be no interments on Sunday, Memorial Day, nor Independence Day. And we want to change that to be mem Memorial Day weekend, Friday through Monday. And here again with a, with a however, this rule may be relaxed at the discretion of the Board of Trustees uh, if, if uh, contagious disease or religious custom necessitates, and we feel that that should be perhaps relaxed a little bit as far as the reasons for um, there may be other reasons as well that you might uh, uh, need to, to complete a burial on, say, Saturday before Memorial Day. But um, if many people was traveling in a distance, exactly, I think would be a consideration. Yeah, there also uh, those things can be scheduled, and uh, when, whenever possible, should be kept away from. That's a very busy time in a cemetery; those two or three days before Memorial Day. And uh, a large funeral there could disrupt lots of things, that, you know. So I, you'd like to discourage that if you could. Anybody get a comment on the uh, the final uh, uh, change that we wish to make, and this gets very complicated, is Section Four under Monuments and Markers. And uh, here again, the uh, the town clerk has a responsibility to administer this section. And it has to do with the size of markers, monuments. And the first thing that you find is you'd like to know the difference between a monument and marker. And I defy you to find out what that is from that section because it, it, it's all mixed together as to what is a monument and what is a marker. And uh, this, this entire section, in my opinion, needs to be rewritten. We don't have the time right now, but what we would like to do is to get a, a and you'll notice down the next to the last paragraph on that page, uh, the, the paragraph we'd like to do away with. It has to do with some uh, percentage sizes of the lot is how to determine the size of the <coughs> monument or the marker that is placed on that lot. And we have some rewording with that with some actual um, uh, inch measurements that we determine from field measurements in the cemetery that are average sizes. And that's the reason for that is so that if uh, someone comes to me and says I want to put a huge monument on my lot that, that would not be conforming to others around it, uh, that she'll have something to stand on to say no, that the regulations say you can't do that. Once again, the, another change we want to make is the last uh, paragraph in this section uh, states that the Board of Trustees reserves the right to refuse permission to erect any cemetery monument, et cetera, and so forth. We'd like to put that at the beginning. That needs to be the first thing instead of the last, is that all these things should be at the discretion or, or uh, come before the board as an appeals basis. Right? Thank you. Does anybody got a, any other comments? So is that all you have? As far I, as those change? are the three changes. Yeah. Do we do we grab a motion here? I'm Councilor Cargishaw. Second. Been moved and seconded. Any other comment? All those in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed, so vote. Very good. Nice right. job, by the way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now it is after our 11 o'clock 
line, I believe it is, in line, to your wishes to continue on with the agenda. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Huh? I know, I got right here. Mr. Chairman. Council Cogshaw. I move that we waive the 11 o'clock deadline in order to take up a new, um, another item of two items on the agenda. Second. But moved and second. All in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed, it's a vote. <laughs> Item 163A, to consider signing the May 1st, 1990 municipal election warrant and take any necessary action. You, I believe, all received the, the notice that Debbie has put out. Do you have any other comments to make? Madam. No, I would just like to announce the municipal election. It will be held on Tuesday, May 1st at the high school gymnasium. The polls will be open at 7 a.m. and closed at 8 p.m. Hopefully by the end of this week we'll, we will have absentee ballots in for any of those folks that cannot make it uh, to vote on Tuesday, May 1st. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I would move that the council sign the May 1st, 1990 municipal election warrant. Second. Been moved and seconded. Anybody else get a comment? All in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed? It's a vote. Seven no, no, I'm for. He's for. I know. <clears throat> I don't, I guess, there's no, any citizens out there? Yeah, there is. Where was Ed? I saw him earlier. Citizen know. discussion of items not on the agenda. Nobody, no comment. Item 164, to consider entering into executive session in order to the town managed to update the town council on negotiating with the Cable Elizabeth Pat Police Patrolman's Association. Now, it's kind of a late hour. Do you want to tackle it tonight? Do you have other items other than this one? Or do you wish to Council Cogshell. Mr. Chairman, I move that we um, consider entering executive session at 5 o'clock on this Thursday afternoon prior to our dinner and workshop with the school board. I won't be there. I have got a jail committee meeting and it starts at five o'clock and it really goes until nine or 10, but I was going to only attend the first part of it. But it appeared to me that we had to meet with the school board. And I have a question as far as meeting with the school board. Do you people eat at six o'clock or is it 6.30 you eat or do you start the budget session before? at six o'clock. What is the intent? Uh, there will be an informal dinner with the school board at 6 p.m., uh, probably down in the cafeteria. The meeting itself will probably be in this room with tables set up in front, and that'll start at uh, 7 p.m. Okay, I'll be here by 7, but I won't be here for the 5 o'clock meeting. Mr. Chairman, I can't make it at 5. I can be here somewhere around 5.15. So it's been moved and seconded. Any other comment? All in favor of the motion, raise your hand. Those opposed? Six to one. Well, I believe that kind of takes care of the agenda for the season. If somebody sees something else that I don't, do I hear a motion? Mr. Chairman, I move we adjourn. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed? Vote seven to nothing. Thank you all. Thank you and the cameramen from staying and the people at home for listening. Sorry about that. Well, it screwed me up. And I missed the last two meetings of the jail committee. I'm going to make this.